Good evening, everybody. Welcome uh, to this webinar to help celebrate and discuss uh, the new book by my colleague, Julia Doe, The Comedians of the King. Julia is joined by other distinguished panelists. Um, we have Professor Olivia Blechel from the University of Pittsburgh, Elaine Sisman from Columbia University, and Joanna Stelnacher from the French department at Columbia University. And I won't uh, spend more time introducing the speakers because you have their biographies or can find them on the website. And instead, I'll just uh, tell you the, the basic outline, which is that Professor Doe will talk about her book or introduce her book for a certain period of time, eight minutes um, approximately. Then Professor Bluckel will speak, respond, Professor Sisman, and then Professor Stahlnacher. Uh, and then Professor Doe will have a chance to respond to those responses. And after all the panelists have spoken, we'll have some time for questions from the audience. So you should see the Q&A box on your screen where you can submit your questions for me to read aloud. You could do that at any point during the presentations, and then we'll look at them uh, after, after that. So uh, with that in mind, I will turn this over to Professor Doe to introduce her book. Thanks so much, Walter, for those words of introduction. Uh, I'm going to share my screen as we get started here. It's been a little slow in waking up today, but I think it should appear shortly. There we are. Um, so thank you to Walter. I'd also like to extend my thanks to my fellow panelists for having engaged with this work um, and to the wonderful mentors, colleagues, students, friends, and family who've taken the time to Zoom in today. I'm sorry we're not meeting in person, but I'm sending my gratitude uh, through this webinar portal. Um, and last but not least, I really should thank the staff of the Heyman Center um, for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit about how this book came to be um, to explain to the many people who supported this project what exactly it is I've been doing with myself for the past 10 years or so. Uh, in writing The Comedians of the King, I've had the good fortune to immerse myself in some remarkable libraries, um, including the French National Archives and the archives of the Paris Opera. Um, my tasks in these glamorous looking locales um, were not always terribly glamorous. Um, I was putting together a narrative of operatic development by combing through stacks of dusty scores, uh, records of theatrical programming, and boxes upon boxes of royal receipts. Um, the picture to the left may prompt a little nostalgia or a little dread amongst the French historians in attendance. In the 17th and 18th centuries, the French monarchy lavished truly extraordinary sums of money on musical spectacle, with expenses ranging from the mundane to the mind boggling. Um, an example of a mundane expense, a few thousand livres for Marie Antoinette's harp teacher. Uh, she took lessons nearly every day. An example of a mind boggling expense, a few million livres for seasons of ceremonial entertainment at Versailles. An inventory of the royal household made on the eve of the revolution gives us a sense of scale here. Um, by this time, the court owned 200 opera sets, 6,500 dramatic costumes, a prodigious quantity of props, more than 82 bunches of feathers, uh, 8,200 bunches of feathers, more than 120,000 gemstones for decorations, a considerable amount of music, and dozens of keyboard instruments. The government made these investments because music and theater were integral to the image making of the state, like the architectural wonders of Versailles or the monumental tableau of Le Brun. Opera was a means of reinforcing royal power and placing it on public display. And this outlook is closely associated with the most prestigious of French lyric genres, uh, the grandly alle allegorical tragedy on musique. 
um, one musicologist calls the tragic works of Jean-Baptiste Lully, for example, the courtiest court operas ever written. Uh, my students are starting to make fun of me for using this clip so often, um, but just for the non-musicologists here, a brief extract from Lully's Armide linked to the court of Louis XIV, um, it should make this association pretty clear. Historians continue to find really interesting things to say about the politics of operas like, uh, like Armide. And I invited Olivia here today um, because her approach to this corpus I particularly admire. Um, but as I, as I dug through the archives of the French court, there were aspects of its theatrical programming that came to surprise me. Um, namely, by later in the 18th century, century, tragedy on musique was not hugely common on the stages of Versailles. So if we were to determine the title of courtiest court opera by sheer frequency of performance, that honor would instead fall to a lyric comedy or opera comique by André Gretry. Um, slightly less known composer than Lully. Um, and this work in particular is Lamont Jaloux, um, premiered in 1778. So here's just a taste of this most frequently performed French court opera of the 18th century. Um, you'll see it's a Figaro-esque domestic comedy. At this point, they're hiding people in closets to avoid the ire of our titular um, jealous lover. <laughs> Il est jaloux, 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 il Lamont Chaloux is an unexpected candidate for such courtly prominence due to the lighthearted nature of its plot and the upstart history of the genre it represents. Opera Comique originated far from Versailles at the seasonal suburban fairs of Paris. The fair players are down at the bottom corner of that slide. Um, but the popular art form was legitimized by the French crown in the 1760s and thereafter was increasingly successful amongst an elite clientele. In The Comedians of the King, I trace how opera comique evolved when transferred from the fairgrounds to a rarefied, royally subsidized context, both at court and in Paris. So what would it mean to read this unassuming comic corpus politically as a product of absolutist patronage? Certainly, I don't have time to cover the details of this in these opening remarks, but I wanted to offer one single quick musical case study to encapsulate some of the issues involved. So here's my three minute case study. The title of my book is a play on the way that the performers of opera comique were identified once they entered the service of the monarchy. So they were called comédien ordinaire du roi or official actors of the king. Um, but my editors and I had a back and forth on this um, for the main king in this study, um, Louis XVI, really didn't care that much about opera on a personal level. Um, it actually made the news when he managed to stay awake all the way through a show. An alternative title then would have been The Comedians of the Queen, um, acknowledging Marie Antoinette's significant impact on French opera in the pre-revolutionary years. Um, I noted her harp lessons earlier, um, but she strongly influenced concert programming at court and in the capital as well. The most famous of her musical endeavors was perhaps the Troupe des Seigneurs, which was a troupe of aristocratic amateurs with whom she performed opera comique at her um, chateau at the Petit Trianon. 
My favorite archival find, I think, um, was the records of the Queen's instrument porters, which allowed me to reconstruct her rehearsal schedule and underscore how all-consuming this activity was for her. One of Marie Antoinette's leading roles was that of Jenny in The Why the Fermier, The King and the Farmer. Just a quick, quick snippet. Uh, Jenny is the fiance of the title farmer. Um, she meets the title king when he gets lost in the woods and then she educates him on the virtues of the countryside. So here is a, about 20 seconds of an aria Marie Antoinette would have sung in this role. Opera Comique held one set of meanings at its premiere in Paris in the 1760s. Its praises of country living were interpreted as gentle critiques of courtly decadence. Um, taken up by the aristocratic troupe des seigneurs in the 1780s, its political potential was somewhat different. Uh, the queen used this performance to solidify ties in her social circle and also to affirm her benevolence towards her rural dependents. And I'm not at all saying that wasn't problematic. The full story of that is unpacked in the book itself. Remarkably, the sets for Marie Antoinette's production of The Why the Fermier are still extant, one of very few from that court collection that survived the revolution. Um, looking at these flats in isolation gives a sense of the stylized rusticity of much 18th century opera comique. But my goal in The Comedians of the King um, was to better account for the context in which that repertory was presented, um, to zoom out if you will, exploring the tensions between the popular heritage of these works and the extravagance of their eventual courtly frame. I'll stop here for now, um, but I really look forward to hearing the thoughts of the panelists um, and expanding on any of these issues further in the Q&A. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Julia, uh, for that great resume of uh, this very rich book. So uh, now we'll hear from Professor Blecho. Um, who will respond. Thank you, Walter. Um, and thank you, Julia, for, for giving us such a wonderful book, giving me the chance to read it in earnest and respond to it here. And also, I just wanted to thank the Heyman Center for making this such a, a smooth process and inviting me. Um, some of what I'll say will recap a little bit of what Julia already said, but I thought I would start by highlighting a few of the key contributions of the book as I see them, and then just pose a few questions I had while I was reading. So this is, as we just saw um, from the PowerPoint, it's partly a documentary study of the institutional history of the Opera Comique in France during the pivotal decades of the 1760s through the 1790s. That is in, in political terms from the end of the Seven Years' War to the period right after the revolution. One of the book's contributions is Julia's extensive work with the documents, some of which she showed us. And I also, I love the action shots from the archive. That's, that's, really, that's really great. And it's nice to see some of those actual documents that you, you, know, you report on. But um, she works with administrative documents, especially pertaining to the musical theater troops that she mentioned, royal arts legislation, box office receipts, press notices, alongside the, the kinds of things that opera historians deal with more commonly, like librettos or scenarios, opera scores, um, production designs, and especially in France, the, the extensive pamphlet literature um, outlining the many debates over opera in this period. But beyond its documentary richness, which I really appreciate, I think her book's contributions are both analytical and especially historiographic. And I wanted to just say a few words about those. So the genre itself of opera comique has received a lot of attention for musicologists, 
But Julia really hones in on an under-recognized moment of institutional change that she argues helps explain some of the really startling transformations that the genre underwent in the decade she focuses on. The 1762 merger of the royally sanctioned Comédie Italienne with the very popular opera comique emerges in her account as a kind of hostile takeover. And it made me think of Facebook's absorption of Instagram, you know, WhatsApp, and, and some of the really popular apps that it perceived as, as threatening its, its market dominance. And this corporate analogy, I think, is apt because of the importance of financial considerations in the institutional changes that Julia documents. I especially appreciate her mention of the financial and political crises of the post Seven Years War period as factors in the institutional upheaval that she documents. I think the impact of France's losses in the Seven Years War is often underappreciated in histories of French opera for understandable reasons. The public debates over opera stress aesthetic matters. But the administrative logic that she sets out so well, it shaped the field of opera production and consumption in Paris and at Versailles. And this logic, I think, did really respond to these faraway events, as well as to more local conflicts. Turning to historiography, Julia's book revises the standard narrative of the opera comique that casts it as almost the polar opposite of French lyric tragedy or tragedy in music, both aesthetically and by extension politically. Uh, she mentioned, I work on the tragedy in music, and I've also been dissatisfied with the received wisdom that the genre was little more than an ideological prop of the monarchy, which it was, it clearly was that. But as Julia shows the usual stark contrast between the tragédie and the lighter, more popular, and maybe most controversially in her account, populist opera comique, this stark contrast between genres doesn't stand up to her scrutiny when she considers the increasing overlap in the 1770s and 80s between their subject matter styles, theatrical tones, and between the institutional machinations that effectively aligns the opera comique with royal priorities and with aristocratic pleasures. Interestingly, this positions the opera comique as more socially conservative than is often recognized and as having undergone more drastic transformation than I certainly understood before reading this book. Acknowledging the partial conservatism of the later opera comique in particular flies in the face of another piece of conventional wisdom that opera reforms aligned with enlightenment social and political changes advocated by the philosoph. But after all, the 18th century didn't belong only to the philosoph, and neither apparently did the opera comique. The overarching aim of her revised story of the opera comique then is, in her own words, to offer a framework that, quote, can better match the nuance of the theatrical world that it confronts. And specifically, she hopes, again, quoting her, to tempt the assumed polarities of opera, excuse me, to temper the assumed polarities of opera comique and tragedy lyric, to deepen our understanding of these genres' political functions, and to better capture the musical complexity, diversity, and contradictions of a society in the process of radical change, unquote. I think the book she's created does achieve these goals. And I know my understanding of the genre, its social world and its political entanglements is much the better for it. So I'll just wrap up by posing three questions to Julia. And if you don't mind, I'll just address these to you directly. And these are mostly just from interest and curiosity. So first, a historical question. I was really struck in the chapters on Marie Antoinette, which I loved, by the way, by the trouble that she ran into with pastoral performances at the Petit Trianon, but especially with her impersonation, her personal impersonation of pastoral figures in the performances she staged, when these were criticized as being beneath the dignity of a queen. 
I was thinking about um, much, much older practices of royal impersonation of undignified characters back, you know, at the beginning of the Bourbon dynasty. Uh, you know, I'm thinking Louis the Thirteenth, especially um, the twenties and the sixteen twenties and thirties. See, I think more about seventeenth century, so I get the wrong century sometimes. But no, the sixteen twenties and thirties, um, and where even royal figures are taking, you know, grotesque, you know, buffoonish or exotic personas, apparently with no risk to their public dignity in just the ceremonial performances you're talking about, like in, in um, Ballet de Cour. And that's a very long time ago. It's very long, right? Uh, from Louis XVI's reign. But it's still striking to me then that it changed so much in between the time. You know, and I'm thinking Louis XIV solved the problem by, you know, the 1680s, just withdrawing from court spectacle, personal participation entirely, right? But so what happened? I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on how that changed apparently so drastically. Does gender have to do with it? Is it different when it's a queen versus a king? I don't know. Um, the second question was just, I wonder if you could clarify how you're using two descriptive terms that you pepper throughout the book. Um, modern and cosmopolitan. It's pretty clear, I think, what characteristics you're, you're identifying with the descriptions. But, you know, of course, they carry value as well as descriptive power. And I'm asking because I, I worry sometimes whenever we take on terms as just descriptive that were in their original context, um, discursively constructed, you know, polemical and, and conveying value. So I'm just curious, you know, do you have any thoughts about that? Are these, are these just useful terms and that's it? And what's the relationship with the idea of mondanite, which comes up once? And finally, um, I got thinking about, and I think I won't share this in the interest of time, but um, I got thinking about, say, the database that Julia Prest has put together on, um, performances in the later 18th century in the French colony of Saint-Domingue, um, which included many opera comique um, or the work that David Power, Powers has done on, on that. Opera capital, very far from the hexagon. And I know that's not your study, uh, but that work is so terrific. And there were so many adaptations of just the opera comique you're talking about. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts about how, how that larger world of French comic opera might um, might fit with the narrative you've created. So thank you so much again. Uh, and I look forward to hearing what everyone else has to say. Thank you so much, Olivia. That, that's great. Um, now we'll turn to Professor Stelnacher for her response. Thanks, Walter. Um, Julia, I'm so glad that we have the occasion to celebrate your, your book together. Uh, I wanna start by congratulating you. And what I wanna talk about first is what I most admire about your book uh, among many things. Um, my sense after reading it is that so often in scholarship, there's a narrative that just makes sense intuitively that just seems like it must be right. Um, but you went into the archives and uh, it seems that you found out that that intuitive narrative was not right. And I think that the best scholarship upends a sort of satisfying intuitive na narrative and offers an alternative one that shows us just how much we've been missing about a, a story that we've been used to hearing. And this to me is, is really what your, your book manages to do very successfully. So the intuitive narrative here, as I understand it, is that tragic opera or tragédie lyrique was in 18th century France, the prototypical genre of the Bourbon propaganda machine. It was supported by and in turn supported the rigid social hierarchies of the old regime. Lyric comedy or opéra comique in contrast was the upstart genre. I think you used that phrase in your opening remarks with its popular origins in the Parisian fairgrounds and its ties to the politically subversive philosophical movement. But what I think your book shows is that in fact, the rise of lyric comedy in the second half of the 18th century was made possible by royal patronage 
Following the integration of fairground players into one of the three royally sponsored theaters, the Italian com comedy or Comédie Italienne. It was in particular the patronage of the foreign born music loving queen Marie Antoinette that made this possible. While her husband, Louis XVI, was largely indifferent to music, as you've mentioned, like my father not managing to stay awake during, during the opera, opera Marie-Antoinette favored opéra comique in Paris and at her faux rustic retreat at Versailles, Le Petit Trianon. And uh, like Olivia, I really loved the chapters on Marie-Antoinette. And one of my favorite things about the book is the way that you give credit to Marie-Antoinette for her musical patronage and show how her patronage of a genre with popular origins paradoxically uh, made her appear even more out of touch with her subjects. So she seems to be doing something that in a certain sense should align her, her with her, her more popular subjects, but it ends up getting her into hot water as so many other things did. Your narrative also considerably complicates our understanding of the question of national taste in 18th century France. So much attention has been paid uh, to the mid-century querelle des bouffons or quarrel of the comic actors in which the philosophes were partisans of the modernizing, passionately expressive Italianate opera against the conservative hegemony of the overly intellectual French music incarnated by Rameau. And once again, you upend this narrative as you grant at the beginning of the book, it's not that these narratives are completely wrong, it's just that they need to be nuanced. So you show that opéra comique came to be considered a national genre, becoming a popular French export, including in the French colonial empire. And that's one of the reasons that I, I think that Olivia's question to you is uh, about Saint-Domingue is a, a very interesting one to pursue. Due to its cosmopolitan blending of Italian musical style with French theatrical trends towards greater naturalness on the stage. So as you put it, quote, it was this emphasis on cosmopolitan mixture, paradoxically, that enabled opéra comique to be claimed as a national art form in its own right. And I had no uh, awareness of the extent to which opéra comique became this sort of French export uh, important to uh, the, the French crown in the way that you show. And I also wanna say, and I, I hope you won't mind me saying this, that as uh, I am a literary scholar who considers an interdisciplinary approach essential to understanding the 18th century, but your book puts me to shame in that, in that respect. Uh, although I've not written on theater, I have taught a graduate seminar that is precisely on transformations in theatrical aesthetic forms and genres as they relate to political changes in the 18th century. And I know that the French Enlightenment is incomprehensible without reference to music and to opera in particular. Diderot's most challenging masterpiece, Rameau's Nephew, is littered with the names of the composers who populate your pages, Gretry, Philidor, Monsigny, Duny, etc. And here I wanna just uh, make a plug for anyone who doesn't know it, for a remarkable multimedia translation of Rameau's Nephew published by Open Book Publishers edited by Marian Hobson with a translation by Kate Tunstall and Carolyn Warman. And in addition to being a great translation of a very challenging work to translate, it's a multimedia edition that allows you to click on a hyperlink when you see, for example, a reference to Rameau's and Galant and listen to a bit of the music. And in some cases even, you know, get connected to a, a video that will show you a, a production of a, an opera of which there are some very interesting modern adaptations. So we get a sort of soundscape of the work as Diderot himself might have heard it or imagined it when he was composing this work. And as his readers, if he had had 18th century readers uh, might have heard it themselves, but a soundscape that is lost for many of us today, or at least for me as a literary scholar. So this thinking of this edition made me wish for something similar. And I'm glad that you played some clips during your opening remark for your book, you know, that we have the scores, we have your analyses of, of the music, but to be able to sort of restitute this soundscape is, is also something that I would really appreciate. So 
to get back to uh, what I was saying about my own ignorance about this uh, area of study, I know that opera is essential to Diderot. I also know that Rousseau originally came to Paris from his native Geneva, not in order to become a writer, not to meet Diderot and join his encyclopedic project, but to present his system of musical notation to the academy. And it's probably not an exaggeration to say that his own uh, Sorry, there it is. His own lyric comedy, Le Devin du Village or The Village Soothsayer presented at mid-century at the Royal Court at Fontainebleau and then in Paris to great acclaim was far dearer to his heart than his entire philosophical system or even his late autobiographical writings. Yet somehow I had managed to write and teach on Diderot and Rousseau over many years without having any awareness of the rich and complex dialogue between two competing forms of opera that your book details. You, in contrast, play, pay close attention to the theatrical forms and genres that influence tragic and comic opera, not notably Diderot's theorization of le drame as a genre between comedy and tragedy that seeks to undo the rigid genre and social hierarchies of the old regime. So I want to express my immense admiration for your considerable erudition, not just with respect to uh, musicology, your primary um, field, but with respect to literary history and the history of, of theater in this period, and for your achievement in this book, which is a genuinely interdisciplinary uh, achievement in the best sense of the, of the word. And I know that I will not, and I cannot read or teach the 18th century in the same way after reading your book. So like Olivia, I wanna conclude by asking just one question. Uh, that reading your book has raised for me. And I want to apologize in advance because to my mind, this is the hardest kind of question to answer about one's own work, <laughs> but maybe you won't find it so. Um, I think it's easy to see what the stakes of the typical account that I outlined at the beginning of my remarks might be. An upstart genre with popular roots wins out over a conservative genre that undergirds the crown's propaganda machine, revolution ensues, aesthetic disruption prefigures and possibly even causes, or at the very least contributes to political upheaval. This narrative is appealing because it is another way of asserting that aesthetic forms matter to our political life. But what about your considerably more nuanced account? In your rich concluding discussion of the historiography of lyric comedy, you ask how opéra comique came to be seen as quote unquote, a people's art associated more with its folk origins than with its subsequent royal patronage. Your account shows us that as you put it, quote, the aesthetics and politics of dialogue opera defied ready categorization and indeed only haphazardly fulfilled the broadly populist claims of third republic historiography. End quote. In addition to the chapters on Marie Antoinette, I found the concluding chapter on historiography very compelling. So I think I've made it clear that I absolutely buy into this more nuanced uh, and somewhat messier in the best sense of the term account, more true to, to the archives. But what are the stakes of this less obvious story in your eyes? In your introduction, you ask what I take to be a well-posed and important question. Uh, and I quote, I ask of Opéra Comique a question that has long stood at the heart of inquiry for French tragic opera. What did it mean for comedy to be put into the service of the monarch, end quote. And so now with a little distance on your, on your book, uh, I wanna ask you to articulate your own answer as you see it today to this question, which I think is another way of asking, what are the stakes of your book for our broader understanding of the relationship between art and politics in 18th century France? So congratulations and thank you so much for uh, giving me the occasion to spend some time with this wonderful book. Thank you so much, Joanna. Um, Professor Sisman. Just going to share my sound. Thank you. It's been uh, wonderful hearing everybody's remarks uh, and it was wonderful reading the book. So I will now respond. In Julia Doe's dazzling new book, The Comedians of the King, the comic opera that elsewhere in Europe supplanted the serious to become the most progressive and capacious form of opera in France sat squarely on top of every fault line starting to rumble towards 1789. 
and it seems to have been the visible enjoyment and patronage of the queen, Marie Antoinette, that unleashed the tremors. Her older brother, Joseph II, the Habsburg emperor, was able to support innovative forms of German and Italian comic opera in Vienna without censure. But then he was also able to walk around in street clothes, avoid court format formality, and was comfortably enthroned in his home country. No such credit was extended to the French queen. And when she sat for the portraitist Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun in a loose fitting muslin dress, far from court etiquette, scandal erupted. Julia expertly reveals the stakes of decorum, both courtly and musical. Power struggles between the branches of the operatic establishment led to such restrictive rules and legal privilege that the public was deprived of their most sought after composers and works. The book's institutional histories and generic transformations are delineated and brilliantly assessed on the basis of the new archival sources Julia discovered and uh, examined. My intention is not to go over these, but rather to comment on three connections that the book allowed me to draw, dealing with strands of later 18th century operatic thinking and influence more generally. First is the role of opéra comique in developing the idea that heightened musical expressions should no longer be limited to highborn characters. The social mobility of musical expressiveness had vitally important ripple effects. In Mozart's opera buffa, The Marriage of Figaro, based on Beaumarchais' widely known and widely censored play, the servant protagonists, Figaro and Susanna, do not step out of their expected stylistic locations until the fourth and last act. But here, Susanna occupies the musical space formerly allowed only to the countess. She is granted a full Shena et Aria with accompanied recitative and an aria with obligato wind instruments. These contratante instruments elevate the station of the rustic musical topic as nature herself seems to join Susanna in singing De Vieni Non Tardar. And forgive me, I'm just gonna play one minute of it with Diana Damro. The second area is the decorum of musical parody when it comes to the fraught subject of venerable historical so styles. Supplanting the Lully Ramot tragedie lyrique in popularity and in royal patronage was one thing, but holding it up to ridicule by satirizing it musically was quite another, both delicious and antagonizing. I noticed that the poster Julia chose to illustrate the renaming of the theater in the revolutionary 1790s, which is pictured on page 199, or you can see that it's called Théâtre de l'Opéra Comique National, it advertises Gretry's Le Jugement de Midas, The Judgment of Midas. This opera premiered in June 1778, it was the same year as La Montjalou, uh, when Mozart was in Paris. Gretry's opera, to a libretto adapted from the English, makes fun of the tragédie lyrique as well as fairground vaudeville tunes by the stratagem of assigning them to unsuitable suitors. The context is especially rich, drawing on the mythical contest between Apollo and Marcius, or as it appears in musical settings like Bach's between Apollo and Pan, Retri's English source makes foolish Midas the father of two young women whose suitors he has chosen so that the four of them will make a good vocal quartet. Marcias the tenor sings slowly and with sighing leaps uh, and the sincerity of overdone appoggiaturas, as in the old serious opera. Pan interrupts him uh, with vaudeville songs and quick nonsense syllables. The girls, of course, prefer Apollo, who sings in the op opera comique's own style, thus positioning Gretry's musical language as first and best. So I'm gonna play you a bit of a duet uh, from The Judgment of Midas. The two men are competing uh, with Apollo. 
and, and you'll hear Marcias beginning in his slow, uh, tragic way. Uh, he's saying how, oh, those of you who are uh, sighing over a, a ungrateful beauty, my torment is far worse than yours. Uh, and Pan is not doing much in the way of saying anything. <laughs> That's enough of Marcias. The conscious assignment of historical styles for onstage ridicule extends to Mozart's Don Giovanni, in which the Don's own contest, Cimento, with his nemesis, Donna Elvira, places her as inappropriately learned in diction and inappropriately elevated in musical style. As Julia makes clear, the admixture of serious elements became essential to comedy, uh, but it could be a two-edged sword. Finally, the latter point leads to her consideration of heroic comedy, to Sargine and especially to the afterlife of Richard uh, Richard Coeur de Lyon, Richard Lionheart, not content to leave the reception of that huge success in 1791, as David Charlton does in his book on Caetri, uh, she studies the different valences of meaning in a work associated with the counter-revolutionary cause brought back to the boards by Napoleon in 18, 1806 and later modernized by Adolphe Adam for a long 19th century run. The signal musical number from the opera did not disappear after 1791, however. The diegetic romance, Un fièvre brûlant, uh, appeared nine times in the opera and was touted by Créteil himself in his memoirs. Uh, although the opera was suppressed by the revolution after 1791, uh, it was translated and had a big run in Vienna, uh, in German, and in, the in 1795, it was turned into a heroic pantomime ballet uh, for Vienna where Salvatore Viganò performed it 32 times in its first year. That same year, Beethoven sketched a set of variations on the romance and as was his custom, would have played them often before publishing them in 1798. The first Paris edition appeared in 1801, well before the stage production came back. There clearly was enormous appetite for a song Grétry said had been consciously written in, a, in an archaic style to please everyone. I like to think that Beethoven's variations helped the opéra comique come back to the stage in Paris. And I like to think that the many keywords Julia keeps alive and aloft through her book can be permitted to extend outside her powerfully delineated history. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Julia, for giving me this terrific opportunity. Thank you for these uh, wonderful responses. And now, Julia, you may have the floor to respond to the responses for a few minutes. 
Oh, goodness. I mean, I can't thank the panelists enough for having come up with such beautiful synopses of my arguments and uh, kind of pushed at the ways um, where it has, where they have broader meaning, um, whether I've recognized it or, or not. That's really gratifying to hear. I keep thinking this is the moment I put the book aside and now finally <laughs> completely clear mind to new projects. And you've given me such like rich things to think about um, that I keep wanting to reflect on them. Um, I almost don't know where to start with the questions. I suppose I can think a little bit, I mean, if we're talking about um, Marie Antoinette and the questions of the pastoral, I'm going back to um, Olivia's initial question, this question of um, representation, why was it a bigger deal if Marie Antoinette was doing this in the 1780s than would have happened in earlier ballet um, court spectacle in the 17th century in France. I think that actually aligns with something that Elaine was saying about this kind of social tr transversal that was allowed a little bit more for Marie Antoinette's brother, Joseph II, um, in Vienna than in Paris at the time, or I suppose it's a question of society has changed around them and that's what has made different kinds of role um, of operatic role playing now um, now out of touch or, or the sense that if distinctions, actually social distinctions are becoming less and less clear in the world outside of the theater, then traversing them in the theater becomes becomes more of a big deal, which had happened by the by the later days of the uh, 18th century, though certainly gender and certainly her foreign nationality um, had a lot to do with the criticisms she raised as well. In terms of, and I think Olivia, also your question about cosmopolitanism might tie into your question about the French colonial empire, might tie into Joanna's question about broader stakes. I'm not sure I can tie all these threads entirely virtuosically just yet. I mean, in most simplest terms, as so Olivia's first question about um, what does it mean for a repertory to be cosmopolitan, I suppose in the most limited sense, the French use that word to mean Italian, um, which is not a really satisfying definition, but everything that is not French is actually Italian in, in this kind of dichotomy that Joanna also, also brought up. But the fact that it's being used that way discursively in music criticism um, certainly makes us overlook the fact that this was also a very extremely well-traveled repertory. Um, there's good uh, good literature on how tragedy lyrique also moved beyond French borders. I mean, Re Rebecca Arendt has talked about that and a little bit um, um, outside of Europe as well. Um, but Opera Comique has been overlooked in this story, um, even though it was much, much more well-traveled. I mean, really got around all over the place to Russia, to Germany, uh, to England in translation, um, to the United States, to Philadelphia, to Charleston, to New Orleans, um, and certainly to the French uh, colonial empire, to Saint-Domingue. Um, Fortunately, there's really good work being done by kind of young scholars um, following Julia Prest and David Powers' model. I know Henry Stoll at Harvard is working a little bit on, on how, far, um, how far this repertory traveled, what kinds of uses it might have for French politics, how it might be inflected. Um, I've also been thinking a lot lately about how none of this cultural transfer is unidirectional. Um, people are moving from France um, to Saint-Domingue in the 18th century um, and, and vice versa, not to mention, of course, um, the kind of brutal implications of, of French enslavement in that same period. I've actually been thinking a lot lately um, to go back to this point about that year 1763, Olivia, that you also brought up or, or what is happening at the end of the Seven Years War. Um, something I'm thinking about now is the movement of um, uh, French colonists, as well as um, the people that they enslaved or their mixed race children from the Caribbean to France right around that time. And that's the first year, or one of the first times that the Chevalier de Saint-Georges enters the French archival record because he's trapped in Paris and the government legislates everyone must, you know, re-register because no one can go back because of the uh, because of the Seven Years War and so do hundreds of other people. And so kind of situating um, this vast entanglement of metropole and empire is something critical to this field, of course, um, as we go forward. And I guess I would say just in closing to Joanna's question, um, I want her politics of this genre to be nuanced. Um, 
I want us to be able, I think I just want the politics of Oprah Comique and the impact that it had to be taken more seriously. Because if it's comic, um, certainly it gets this underdog story, but the way that the works themselves are impacting the society around them and reflecting those social changes um, hasn't quite been told properly. So I think looking at this repertory in a variety of contexts um, and looking at it in all of its nuances um, is something I want to think about, and I'll, I'll think of a new ways to 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 articulate that more clearly. <laughs> That's such a good question. No, I so appreciate these responses and the way they've made me think about this material. I thought I couldn't think about anymore. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, maybe we'll have more discussion. We have probably about ten or fifteen minutes left. There is a one question from my colleague, our colleague Lydia Gurr who says that she has not read the book yet, but hopes to, and it, it sounds wonderful. She says, I only wanted to ask about the theory of comedy that emerges from the study. Elaine Sisman said something about this. Could you say a little more about theory of comedy that might emerge? I think it's, I'm gonna punt it to Julia if she did. <laughs> I, mean, I talked about Julia's points in, a, in essence about the, uh, the growth of comedy to allow a movement among, uh, well, to allow expressiveness, not only to inhere in noble characters, but for uh, modes of heightened musical expression to be shared by all since they're common to all. Uh, and also that the, uh, the theory of parody that seems to emerge is, well, Julia, you. <laughs> say more, oh no, certainly. More than I. Yeah, I know. I really appreciate Elaine how you've drawn some of the innovations in the in these French works to uh, kind of the bigger names of Mozart, of Beethoven, who certainly were extremely familiar with this repertory. I would say what I'm adding to discussion of opera comique, especially from the literary side, is concentrating much more on the interaction of music and text, as we opera scholars are prone to do, uh, because these works don't quite make sense just on the page or there's often so much going on in the way that the music is reacting to stylistic convention, um, which is very, very tricky in the French context because stylistic convention is just not not simply a matter of decorum, you know, king should sing in one way, peasant should sing in another way, but it's also a matter of legal statute. The opera, the most prestigious of French institutions has a patent, essentially a monopoly on musical expression and so can dictate to other theaters um, what kinds of music they, they use in their spectacle. So certain kinds of music are technically off limits to opera comique, which adds a new layer to these character transversal. So if a character is using a forbidden musical language, both in terms of decorum and in terms of the law, it can really tell you a lot about uh, these kind of mixing of registers that we see in French, adding a layer to the mixture of registers we see in those huge trends in French spoken theater at the same time, the drum bourgeois, um, and so on. That was flabbergasting to learn that the audiences wanted to hear Italianate material, but the opera uh, prevented the opera italienne from do doing it, but they themselves were not going to pick up the slack. So no one would get to. Yeah, a lot of those rules were really pretty, um, pretty ridiculous. Um, Elaine is referring to the fact that essentially when anything was successful for the these comic actors, the higher rung on the theatrical ladder, the opera would uh, would make them stop doing it. So as soon as they were successful with translating Italian operas in Paris, the opera said, no, 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 you've misread, you've misread our patent. You, you can't, in fact, uh, can't, in fact, do that anymore, even if they had no intention, yeah, as you said, of using it themselves, yeah. Couldn't perform on Tuesdays or Fridays because uh, that's when they wanted to put on operas, that kind of thing. Um, I just wanted to ask, it was fascinating to hear you play the aria or section of it that Marie Antoinette herself would have sung. And it made me wonder a little more about the singers. Uh, but specifically, I was thinking, gee, did they, you know, it sounded like it wasn't that hard to sing. Did they fashion that for her like the way Cole Porter, you know, wrote for, um, you know, Fred Astaire or Lerner and Lowe, sorry, I'm teaching my musical sports, <laughs> wrote for Rex Harrison, you know, t tailoring those songs. Uh, I was wondering at all if 
I mean, you, perhaps you talk about this in the book and I can't recall, but you know, certainly Marie Antoinette is a singer, but the other singers who were available at any rate at, at Versailles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what was the capability, what were the capabilities of these particular singers as well as kind of what were the technical demands of opera comique more generally? Um, well, it got a whole lot harder over time, is what I would say. So the earliest works in my in my study um, from the 1760s or so were, were quite challenging. They did have moments of virtuosity, um, but, but they weren't that difficult to put together and ensembles were quite small because that was also something that was legally legally defined. Um, as we get into the 1770s, 1780s, 1790s, um, the technical mans are certainly as, as challenging as what might have gone on at the opera. And actually, I didn't mean to do this, but the first opera comique that I showed in that example, La Mante Jaloux, um, a quite intricate ensemble work, um, the, the Troupe des Seigneurs tried to do that. Um, there's a little note in one of the registers that says, you know, Great Tree called to the Trianon to help produce this work, uh, but it, it did not, it did not ever happen. I don't think they could put it together. So there, there was kind of a, a limit um, past which an amateur theatrical company wouldn't, wouldn't have, would have had trouble going, going past. Thank you so much. Um, so we have a few more minutes. Are, do our panelists uh, have more questions for each other or for Professor Doe, uh, Joanna, please. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you to speak a little bit more about the question of gender, um, simply because, you know, the question of, of women appearing on stage and what the implications of that are for a reversal in power uh, relationships between men and women it was a particular preoccupation, as you know, obviously for someone like Rousseau. So I think your book really gives us a sense of the class implications of the interaction between opéra comique and tragédie lyrique, but perhaps less about um, gender playing out differently in those two genres. Mm. Is that something that you think is important to this story or, or not so much? Oh gosh, yeah, that's such a rich question. It is true that I don't deal with that too much, though of course it is deeply entwined with the story of Marie Antoinette and the ways that you know people were um, concerned about her traversing you know the boundaries of power and that you know shown in taking over artistic patronage um, and so on. I could also say, of course, and you would know uh, better than I in terms of the drum, but or just the 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 kind of idea of sensibilité and sentiment and uh, you know being moved to tears at the op at the opera um, that dialogue is much more associated like the power uh, the kind of the power of spectacle the power to move is much more associated with the opera comique um, than the tragedy on music even though it is associated with both and i would say that that of course is giving power to uh, to women who are su suffering i mean it's kind of the the beginnings of or the continuation of this long story of operatic heroines um, who we must see suffer um, to feel you know to feel that connection on stage and i would say that's very closely connected with with this culture of sensibilité um, and and the opera comique yeah yeah, thanks. That's great. Thank would, you. So much. Would any of that have been a problem for the queen to be seen suffering? I mean, it was it was hard, bad enough for her to be seen representing anyone who was not monarchical, but yeah, emotional. Yeah, so I'm trying to think. She does face somewhat serious situations in *The King and the Farmer*, the Wild the Fermier kind of uh, attacks on her dignity from a, a bad aristocrat, basically. Um, but that did that kind of critique didn't come up as much, I think, mostly because these events weren't hugely well pub well publicized in her own personal performances. It was kind of a limited circle of who could see them. Thank you so much. Well, we're approaching the 7:15 hour. Um, I'd like to, first of all, remind our audience that the if you look in your chat box, the it'll tell you where to buy this wonderful book, which you should all be interested in buying if you haven't already done so. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, all of our panelists and Julia for this really interesting uh, evening and to the Society of Fellows for sponsoring it. And congratulations again to Julia for this really superb study. And we'll see you all at the next 
webinar. Thank you again. I think Joanna was trying to applaud, but we don't have little icons. Oh, so okay. I think we want to applaud Julia. <laughs> Thank you so much for your reactions. Um, I so appreciate it. And thanks to everybody who I can't see from afar. <laughs>